I'm going to do the obligatory embarrassing introduction because I told Carolyn that I'm doing it for everyone, so she'll have to endure a little bit with me. So uh, we want to welcome uh, Carolyn Comer to, uh, with us, to talk with us today. She is the president of Shell Energy North America and senior vice president of Shell Energy Americas. She has more than two decades of experience where she is responsible for Shell's gas, power, and environmental products trading business in the Americas. Prior to Carolyn's current role, she was vice president of downstream strategy and portfolio, where she played a critical role in transforming Shell's strategy to purposely and profitably deliver uh, more and cleaner energy solutions. Carolyn started her career in Shell at Shell in 1998, and since then has built up a background across a broad sector, which includes global commercial lubricants, specialties, commercial fuels and trading and supply, as well as commercial fuels UK and the Nordics, and, glo and a global leader, marine fuel sales, where she has led large commercial teams through major business transformations, feels like what we may talk about today. Uh, Carolyn moved to Houston in 2015, where she took over all commercial non-trading activities for Shell Energy Americas, where she was instrumental in driving key strategic growth initiatives, such as successful new, mar new market entries in Brazil and Mexico. Carolyn holds a bachelor's degree in international marketing and languages and has a master's in IT management from the University of Sheffield. So as you can see, we have, uh, as we try to do every time, secured great speakers to talk with us a little bit about really important issues. So Carolyn, welcome. This is your first time to be with us and we're delighted to have you with us today. Thank you, Todd. It's great to be here. Great. Well, let's just kind of jump right in. Uh, I'll offer the same reminder that I failed to do at the first panel. So don't forget, you can uh, go to the app and you can uh, submit questions uh, if we have time for them. Of course, we will try to get to them. Christina will be collecting them uh, and will awkwardly come up here and deliver questions like I did for Sonal. Yeah. So um, we'll go ahead and get started. So Carolyn, the first thing we want to talk about a little bit is how does Shell see the future energy mix? And beyond that, where is power going to fit into the broader mix, and that probably deals with electrification and gas and electric related issues. So take, take that as broad as you'd like. Wow, okay. Um, so where does Shell see the future of energy? I mean, we see it as, as pretty exciting, to be honest. We're, we're a company that's been in the energy system for over 100 years. Um, and actually, we've gone through a number of transitions mm -hmm. uh, through that time. I think the one that we're faced with is seismic. Uh, and I think it's probably going to happen quicker than anything we've seen in the past. Um, I think we're well positioned uh, uh, to, to tackle the challenges that are ahead of us, but we also see it as, a, as an opportunity. Um, I think it's a time for a serious investment. Um, I think it's a time when companies who know how to research and develop and innovate but to do that at scale um, really do have an opportunity. And I think that's one thing that we, we have in our history is the ability to innovate energy, but replicate and scale mm -hmm. because the demand for energy is not getting any smaller. Um, you know, we're going to add 2 billion people to the planet by 2050. We expect energy demand to double in that period. Um, and so the ability to really drive energy innovation uh, to bring some of these technologies that are here today, but mm -hmm. some that are still in the lab, to actually bring those forward and make them available uh, in a way which is affordable, uh, but also cleaner uh, and, and can you know, hit the reliability needs that we're all talking about here uh, today. I mean, that's just super important. So I'm quite excited about the future. Yeah, that doubling certainly speaks to the energy expansion question, not merely the energy transition, as I noted at the beginning. So yeah. you note that Shell has made a lot of investments uh, of significant dollars, frankly, in sustainability and a lower emission future. Can you talk a little bit about maybe what's in the works and what you think the future holds from Shell's perspective, but maybe even more broadly across the sector? Yeah, sure. It was interesting. I was listening to the early speakers about you know some of these technologies have to happen. Um, we've made quite a number of investments already. We've got about a $25 billion CapEx mm -hmm. budget annually, and about a third of that today is, is going into low and no carbon uh, technologies, and I would expect to see that grow over time. Um, but we're, we're actually already active in a number of these technologies, so I was, I was kind of smiling when we heard about CCS. We're, we're actually already actively involved in three carbon capture and storage projects around the world, and we have another 11 in the development funnel. Um, so, so that's live and that's happening right now. Um, similarly on hydrogen, um, we own and operate about 10% 
of global hydrolyzer capacity. And actually, I'm really excited because we're in the process of building Europe's largest electrolyzer in Holland, mm -hmm. the Holland Hydrogen One. It's about 200 megawatts. And it's set up to be able to take um, power from our offshore wind facility, uh, HKN, which is in the North Sea. Um, so a lot of what we were kind of talking about with blue hydrogen and green hydrogen, it's actually happening and it's mm -hmm. happening now. Um, biofuels is huge for us. We've been in biofuels for many years and I think we're probably one of the world's biggest, if not the biggest distributor of biofuels. But we're also investing in their manufacture. So I'm really pleased that we have a, we have a refinery, um, so produced kind of you know, traditional hydrocarbon fuels uh, at Convent in Louisiana, which we mothballed about three, three or four years ago. We're actually bringing that back up as a biorefinery, so specifically mm -hmm. dedicated to producing bioethanol and biodiesel. Um, and of course, we have a major joint venture with Raizen in Brazil. So we've just, November of last year, uh, we signed an agreement with them to take over 3 billion litres of cellulosic ethanol from sugarcane waste, which is fantastic because that's a biofuel which doesn't compete uh, with, 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 with food production, so so-called second generation bio, which I think is really, really important when we talk about a sustainable uh, strategy. And of course, we're in power. I mean, we've been in the not, power not game. Not to be left out. Not to be left out. Uh, we've been in the power game for many years in, in this market since, since markets actually liberalized. Mm -hmm. um, and we're in the, the production generation end. Um, we also have our retail business. Um, and I see many of my colleagues from the retail business are here today. And then my job is really to kind of piece together the supply portfolio mm -hmm. and the demand portfolio so that we can move and optimize the electrons in a way which gets you you know, the energy in the most affordable and cost competitive way. I mean, that's basically what I do. Sure. Uh, and our prior panel with all the technology, it's, it's one of those where you're like, you can see some of the data points lining up Absolutely. on how we're going to make that happen. So the talk that, you know, we've been dealing with around IRA and other things is really about decarbonization in many ways. So I'm interested in your perspectives on decarbonization efforts and what how do they fit together with securing reliable and cost-effective or affordable power? Because oftentimes those two, those two objectives are intention. So how do you think about those? Yeah, I mean, you know, we've all heard the conversation about the energy trilemma, mm -hmm. which I think is a, a, a potentially a made-up word, but, uh, but it speaks to affordability, uh, security, and cleaner. Mm -hmm. um, and I think sometimes the argument gets quite simplistic that clean and affordable can't actually go hand in hand. You know, I would argue, actually, if we don't clean up our act and we don't deal with climate change and we don't tackle the environmental stresses that we're causing, actually the cost will be greater than the cost of investing in clean technologies in the first place. So I don't see affordable and clean as mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. I think it's hard because you don't necessarily see it directly on your electricity bill that comes in the door month on month. Mm -hmm. But make no mistake, you know, storms like URI, wildfires in California, the ratepayer is paying. You know, you are paying for these catastrophic climate events which are happening more and more frequently. And so to my mind, affordable and clean are actually highly compatible. Mm -hmm. Now the industry, it's beholden upon us to be able to tell that story. Right. And I don't think we've told it very well so far. Uh, and it's a difficult story at times to tell uh, because it requires more than, as you note, it's overly simplified is sometimes not the best explanation that we're going to be able to share with folks. Indeed. So, so how do you think we approach decarbonization at the scale that will be necessary? I know we, uh, Sean talked a little bit about CCUS. You mentioned that you're engaged in that. And I was glad we talked about hydrogen a little. There'll be no quiz to identify what all the colors mean. Thank goodness I would <laughs> fail miserably since there's at least five and I'm probably missing several. But how do you think about those and how do we do it at scale? And what do you think are some of the barriers to greater adoption? Yeah, I mean, you know, scale requires investment. You know, and you, know, you can listen to any commentator out there, but you're talking trillions of dollars of investment uh, that's needing to go into the so-called energy transition. Um, the good news is I think that money does exist. The question is whether or not you can attract it 
into the investment portfolios that we need in this energy system. And, and you know, capital's quite simplistic. You know, it's a risk reward equation at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and, and so the, the real controllable, I believe, is, is actually the risk. And that's where I think good regulation comes into play, creating the enabling frameworks mm -hmm. that gives capital a certain sense of certainty, that gives capital a sense of stability, because some of these investments are very, very long cycle. You know, if you look at something like offshore wind or CCS, that ain't paying back in 18 months. Right. So, so, you know, it, it, it's unfair to expect capital to go into a project where you don't know if the same regulation is going to apply in 18 months, and therefore that capital will go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So to my mind, good, stable, consistent regulation, creating enabling frameworks. You don't have to pick a technology. In actual fact, I think when, when regulation tries to pick a technology, it doesn't do it particularly well. Mm -hmm. um, but creating the framework that allows market-based mechanisms to allow these technologies to emerge, I think that is really one of the biggest things that our governments, our regulators can do mm -hmm is to support the attraction of the capital into the space that we're in. You know, for me, I mean, very simply in Shell, the US is our biggest capital investment market, and, and, and we take the same approach. Mm -hmm. It's a risk-reward thing. Right. Um, I, I want more of that capital coming in, but, but I need a stable regulatory environment to, um, to enable me to justify you know, the, the outlay to begin mm -hmm. with. Right. I, I swear I did not coach her on the durable, sustainable market message. Clearly, we're just in perfect alignment. <laughs> so it's always nice to have a member, you know, say the same things that you're saying. So we're delighted to hear that. Of course, part of that discussion of, is natural gas. Yes. And there are some who suggest that we're past natural gas. There are others who say it's the fuel of the future, the bridge. No one knows how long it is. How do you and how does Shell view the role of natural gas both now and as we look forward to this mm. energy expansion or energy transition? Look, natural gas is just critical to this energy transition. It's critical from a reliability perspective. And, you know, if anybody ever needed convincing, then what we saw in Europe this mm -hmm. winter um, was, was about as convincing an argument as you can make for, for nat gas. Mm -hmm. um, LNG did save us. Um, and, and we are investing in LNG Canada, which um, actually, I, my business is preparing for pre-commissioning on, on that facility this year. Um, so we genuinely do believe in, in, in gas. Uh, we think it's going to play an important role for some time to come. I, I think gas, though, is also a fuel in transition. Um, and so I'm excited about the prospects for things like renewable natural gas, um, where you can actually take waste, mm -hmm. um, produce low carbon intensity gas, but also in many cases, the residual you can actually take and, and recycle. So you get the circular economy effect uh, as well as the low carbon gas. And so I'm very excited about renewable nat gas. Uh, I'm very excited about responsibly sourced gas, which is really where you're trying to take methane emissions out of the supply chain because methane is a damaging greenhouse gas. Um, so I, I, I do think that gas has a huge role to play. We're building our renewables portfolio, and, and I remember when our new CEO came in, the first question he said to me was, Carolyn, if I asked you gas or battery, what would you say? And I said, I would say gas and battery. I mean, mm -hmm. you need all of the dispatchable, firm dispatchable capacity that you can get mm -hmm. in order to support your renewable build out. Yep. It's, it, again, it's not a mutually exclusive thing. Mm -hmm. It's not one or the other. It's a combination. And I see gas as just such an important part of that mix. Mm -hmm. if, if only s some others would kind of adopt that message about their, they, they have a very mutually beneficial relationship. That, that seems to be missing from some of the discussions here in Washington, to be sure. So what do you think the industry needs to do to improve access to reliable electricity? Or maybe asked another way, how do we ensure the delivery of ever more reliable electricity? Because as you know, there's going to be more people around the world, certainly here in the United States, but globally, who mm. want reliable electricity. As Jim Robb talked about, we can't have the interruptions in service. Certainly, we agree with that sentiment. Uh, we may have a couple of different routes to get there. But in, in the end, how do you think about delivering that reliable energy to consumers? Yeah. Um, you know, I think that, you know, when we think about the growth in electricity demand, it's going to come with some challenges. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I don't think anyone can underplay the role of transmission and distribution there. Uh, we are underinvested in infrastructure in this country, not just in, in the wires, uh, but also in the pipeline infrastructure that it takes to get, for example, uh, nat gas into gas fire generating plants. Um, so I, I really think the infrastructure challenge is huge. Uh, I think getting infrastructure permitted and licensed, it takes way too long. Um, and I, so I think reform of, um, you know, how we go about uh, permitting new infrastructure mm -hmm. development, I think it's absolutely critical uh, mm -hmm. from my perspective. Um, you know, I, I, I do think there's a role for incentivization to play to really bring some of these technologies forward quicker. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, actually, I'm really heartened by the appearance of the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, I think the US has really put a firm stake in the ground as to its attitude. Mm -hmm. Um, it's put a firm stake in the ground that it's got supportive policy to industry. Um, and so I think somebody earlier mentioned the carrot and the stick. Mm -hmm. I like the idea that the US has gone the carrot route. I think it's the right way to go because it, it protects the industrial base at the same time as we, we actually embark on, on an accelerated energy transition. So I think it's actually kind of leading the world from that perspective. And more of that, please. <laughs> it's interesting you say that. I was just talking to our friends from Alberta last week, and uh, there was someone who made the comment that Canada has a basket full of sticks, and the US now with the IRA has a basket full of carrots. Yeah. And they said, we would encourage our Canadian uh, electeds to maybe think about a box of carrots as opposed to the sticks, as they feel like they've been beaten about the head and neck. And so I thought well, that was an I, interesting and perspective. You're, you're absolutely right. And you know, speaking as a, you know, this is obviously not an original Texan accent, but speaking as a European, I can recognize a lot of those sticks, mm -hmm. to be honest. And I worry about that because if the carrot stick tension continues to to accelerate and increase, which it has the mm -hmm. potential to do. You start getting into a world of carbon border tax adjustments, people trying to protect industrial bases. Before you know it, you're in a protectionist environment. Mm -hmm. And the one thing we all know about protectionism is it causes economies to shrink, not grow. Mm -hmm. And that ain't good for nobody. Right. So uh, it, yeah, I would love to see more governments sit up and, and pay attention to what the US is trying to do with the Inflation Reduction Act uh, and maybe look at that as, as a lead that they want to follow. And, and of course, you note the um, permitting and siting challenges, and it seems to be the thing we talk about here right now. That's the one thing that everybody's paying attention to. So with any For luck, sure. we'll maybe land somewhere in a, in a positive spot. So you talk about your investment budget, which is substantial, but there have to be the right conditions. You mentioned what some of those might be, but how can we help encourage more of that innovation um, and deployment of some of those new technologies. And I, I guess two parts to that. What's the government's role? Mm -hmm. if, if the government's role is to either help or get out of the way. And then is there a difference between what you see us doing here and maybe beyond the IRA, but certainly some of that. And then what you see in other jurisdictions, which might be instructional either as a model to follow or a cautionary tale about mm -hmm. you don't want to replicate what's being done in other, this other place in the world. Yeah, let me start with the second part first. Um, you know, I think the U.S., why is the U.S. such a, 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 an important investment market for a company like ours? Mm -hmm. I think because you have generally created the right conditions uh, for companies like ours to come in and invest and spend and stay. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's really important. Um, what are the, some of the things that, that you have done? I think you've created market-based mechanisms. And, and again, more of that, please, mm -hmm. um, because I think markets are efficient and they, and they will find solutions uh, with the best enabling frameworks in place. I think there's less market intervention. Um, you know, if you look at the last year, many markets around the world have seen unexpected mm. and in many cases, uneconomic market interventions, which have really turned um, frankly, investment theses on their heads mm -hmm. and, and create that level of uncertainty that actually causes people who, who were going to invest in your economy or your country to pull back and pause or maybe even divert that capital mm -hmm. elsewhere, like to the US, yeah. where you've seen less market intervention. So I, I think that's probably the, 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 the sobering um, 
um, reality that we've seen in many of, particularly our power markets mm -hmm. uh, uh, this year. And that's not something I think which is conducive to accelerating the transition and accelerating the investment profile. So I think there's a lot for governments to take away and, and reflect on through mm -hmm. the last year or so. Now it has been highly unusual. It's right. been a highly unusual year and um, you know, I don't think any of us could have seen a, a war in Ukraine come. Uh, I think it continues to be a, an absolute human tragedy. Mm -hmm. But from an energy system perspective, it's also one of the biggest disruptions I've seen in my lifetime. Sure. Um, you know, I, I, I run a trading organization. Typically, we like volatility. Mm -hmm. But you can have too much of a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and frankly, the, you know, the, the swings that we saw uh, in pricing last year were were probably a little too much of a good thing, to be honest. Um, so, so, yeah, I think that, you know, helping governments helping to settle markets. Um, I think, I think, encouraging investment. Uh, there's an interesting standoff at the moment in the LNG space, where on the one hand the U.S. is being asked to invest in new liquefaction capability, but on the other hand, the long-term contracts that would underpin the investment are not yet coming, yeah. um, and that's a problem because that's a, that's a standoff that you know is going to result ultimately in less supply, not more, and greater volatility. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think there's a lot that the, that you know the politicians, the regulators, uh, really need to reflect on and be quite thoughtful and well considered, not just in the short term, sure. but what's this going to look like as it plays out over the next 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, because some of the regulation is going to have to reflect on 10, 20, 30 years, not just the next two or three. I aspire to have politicians adopt that timeline and the time horizon. Speaking as a former elected, more often than not, people are concerned about two or four or six years from now. And as you know, you don't make a 30-year investment decision based on a two or a four-year time horizon. No. So if we can maybe look up instead of down, we may end up getting a little closer to that. So um, you, you mentioned uh, around this a little bit, so I'll just ask you directly about environmental and social justice that are becoming yeah. more and more important to the development and access to energy, and, and that really is both sides of the equation. What's that mean from your perspective? How do you view that here in the U.S. or even more broadly? Yeah. So, so um, you mentioned I was, I was in the strategy team, and, and I was part of the the, the team that refreshed the Shell strategy we launched in 2021, and it's called Powering Progress. But effectively, it stands on four pillars. So the first is generating shareholder value, obviously. Uh, the second is around accelerating our, our, our journey to net zero emissions and, and doing that purposefully and profitably. But there are two other pillars of that. One is respecting the environment. Um, so really positively contributing to biodiversity. We are a heavy industry, so there are things that we can do um, to be a good uh, uh, community member and, and a good neighbor from mm -hmm. an environmental perspective. Um, and and a, a most obvious one for me here uh, is actually plastic waste recycling. Um, and I'm, I'm really pleased to see that we're actually putting um, a lot of tonnage of plastic waste back through our chemical crackers um, uh, in the U.S. Gulf Coast facilities, so we can take waste out of the environment and actually give it a, a purposeful use. Um, and then that fourth one is, is really around powering lives. Mm -hmm. So that is, you know, our ambition is to be the most diverse and inclusive company that we can be. Um, I, I think the challenge that we face with the energy transition is mega, and we, we need to be able to bring the best minds to bear wherever they may come from. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and we need to do that in a way which is sustainable. Um, so we have a lot of work going on on the diversity and inclusion uh, uh, front. Uh, I'm probably a product of that, actually. You know, having a woman sitting at the top of a, of a trading shop in, in, in a trading industry um, is, is kind of highly unusual. And um, actually, I'm really pleased to say that, that Shell's trading and supply leadership team, I think, is now more female than, than male. Um, I think Jill would agree with that. I think she would, <laughs> she would, but I've got Alice Acuna, she, she leads Shell's global LNG trading business. Uh, Stacy Pitts is head of mm -hmm. uh, global crew trading for us. I obviously have the gas and power book. And, and you know, our legal counsel, our head of risk, our, our head of compliance, they're, they're all female actually. Um, you know, go back 10 years, you could never have imagined a world mm -hmm. like that. And I think we're better for it. 
Um, so, so whether it's gender, race, ethnicity, you know, more diversity of background, experience, thought, you know, will give you more robust outcomes, which gives you better business results ultimately. Yeah. So, so I'm a big believer. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you the following question, so I want to make sure that I do that before we, as I'm watching our clock tick down. What do you view are the benefits or the opportunities for competitive markets in the U.S. to help deliver reliability, but also affordability or cost effectiveness? I mean, how, how are you viewing markets as, you talked about it a couple of times, but mm -hmm. what are some of your key takeaways for people to think about as we look at how we use the market to be able to deliver the outcomes that consumers want? Yeah, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, what do consumers want? You know, they Lights want on, beer cold, exactly at a price I can afford to pay. That's exactly right. Um, you know, so to my mind, that's really what competitive markets are all about. It is about ensuring that the energy shows up mm -hmm. when the energy is needed. But actually, it shows up in a way which is most competitive and most affordable. And I sometimes think, you know, when people say, well, what's the role of competitive markets? The clue is in the title. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, competitiveness. Right. Uh, and, you know, I think that's really where we bring a lot to bear. But we also bring, a, 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 you know, with competitiveness comes, comes a need to continually innovate, mm -hmm. continually reinvent. You know, and that's when you start to see, you know, solutions emerge and continue to emerge, be that in the digital and data space. And, you know, as, as someone who runs a team that dispatches power assets in real time, mm -hmm. and, and they've become more fragmented, they become more intermittent, you know, the value of things like data and digital technologies to really help us drive innovation, drive efficiencies. You know, I think competitive markets, that's what we're designed to do. Mm -hmm. We're designed to compete. We're designed to compete in a way that actually you always are looking for that next best thing. You're, you're, you're continuously improving. And so I think competitive markets have a lot to offer. I think the, the governments and regulators need to create enabling conditions to allow that to continue. I almost regret asking you another question after that <laughs> great defense of markets, but I will ask you, and, and certainly your enthusiasm is contagious. I mean, it's clear that you really enjoy the energy space and what it can deliver. As you look at, pick a time horizon, five to 10 years, mm -hmm. what, what are you looking at that excites you the most about where we are, but also where we're going? Yeah, uh, I think what's, what's exciting me right now, and I think it's only gonna go one way, is, is the demand side of things. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if I go back even five years and I think about the conversations I had with customers, decarbonization was kind of an esoteric theme, but didn't necessarily mean very much. Sure. Uh, rolled forward five years, and I have so many large companies come and going, we need a decarbonization roadmap, we've made commitments, we have no idea how to get there, work with us. Mm. And so what excites me most is I believe that energy transition is a huge collaborative effort on a scale you've never seen before. And, it's, and, it, and, and, and the demand drive is only going one way, mm -hmm. but it's not just users and it's not just producers, it's capital providers, it's, it's regulators, it's NGOs. Like we just need to really, on a scale never seen before, we need to deploy a collective effort which is all pointing in one way. Mm -hmm. The more we argue internally in that, in that collective, yeah. the less likely we are to make the progress in the time frame that is really needed. Right. That's a great answer. So uh, we have questions from the audience, so you're still welcome to submit questions if you have others for Carolyn. So Carolyn and none of the Shell staff are allowed to submit it. <laughs> Just saying. Disclaimer, put the asterisk here. <laughs> so, uh, the, the question is, how do we incorporate a cost of less reliable power supply to society as a whole into the bills that customers pay for uh, electricity? So I think we're, we're trying to get to um, how do we mitigate that reliability question while maintaining that focus on the ultimate cost payor? Yeah. So for me, again, lots of simplistic discussions, but um, transition it's simply a process of getting from A mm -hmm. to B. Um, it is not an on-off switch. Um, and, and we've seen the switch get flicked a couple of times um, in, in recent years with, with catastrophic effects. Mm -hmm. 
So I think, you know, for me, it is about a thoughtful, well-considered transition. That means don't retire your reliable generation too early. Uh, it means encourage the development of firm dispatchable generation. It means thoughtful integrated resource planning, including T and D. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, again, it comes back really to that. That's a massive collective effort mm -hmm. to get that thinking done, and then to get you know take that first step, that second step. But again, I don't think affordable and clean are mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. I think you've got to understand the indirect cost of doing nothing is likely to be far greater than the direct cost of paying you know, a slight premium for your energy in the short term. This is clearly a rapid fire question as I see our clock counting down. So um, you and Jim, uh, Rob, have both mentioned T&D investment and dispatchability mm -hmm. as being critical. What about the use of uh, DER, or distributed energy resources, and making demand flexible on the other side of the equation? Uh, I love DER. Uh, we're one of the biggest demand response providers uh, in the ERCOT market today through our retail business. Um, it, it, it is just another way of looking at generation, actually. Mm -hmm. Negative load is as valuable to me as, as positive gen. Mm -hmm. um, and not wanting to open the can of worms that is the capacity argument, but <laughs> maybe I'm going to anyway. Uh, but I think all of those resources come to play when we look at adequate capacity in a market. Sure. Uh, what I like about them is they're responsive. Uh, I'm not paying them simply to exist. Um, uh, they can flex up and down at short notice. So I'm a huge believer in flexible, variable resources as a means of being able to balance your grid. I, I think it's really important. Mm -hmm.